So tonight we're going to continue our study through the book of Hebrews. Um, last week we kind of built on the foundation um, of Jesus being better. Jesus is better. Um, we talked about all the ways that Christ is better than the angels. He, he is so much better, uh, the Bible says. And beginning even with his name. Uh, we know that God gave him a name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, one day every knee will bow. Um, God also called him son, which in Hebrew uh, culture made him equal with God. He is of the same essence as his father. He is heir to everything. We talked about Christ's position, and it's better, it's greater, higher than the angels. They worship him in heaven. And one day when he returns, all of the angels will worship him. Everyone will worship him. He is the chief one. He is higher than anyone else. He's higher than the angels. He created all of the angels. They are his ministers, his servants. And his throne is better than any throne that any angel has ever occupied because it's God's throne. And God himself declared that. And God himself declared that Jesus is Lord. And God declared it from heaven, and we declare it from this pulpit that Jesus is Lord. And so just in case you're wondering if you're at the right rally, Jesus is Lord here. And if you believe that, you're in the right place. Now, if you don't believe that, hopefully God will change your mind before this night is over. We talked about Christ's anointing, how it is so much higher than the angels or anyone else's, for that matter. His anointing is threefold because he holds three offices, right? Prophet, priest, and king. And he is the only Messiah, the anointed one. Christ's existence is far better than the angels. He was before all things. He created everything. He created the heavens and the earth and all that is within them. And one day all those things will pass away, but he will not. He will remain because he is divine. He is eternal. He is immutable. And Jesus is destined to be the highest king of heaven for of all of eternity. And the angels are destined to be his servants and to be the servants of the saints. We also read that no angel has ever been offered to sit at God's right hand. But that is precisely where Jesus is and where he will be for all of eternity. And that's where we pick up tonight. Because Jesus is superior to the angels, because he is the method by which God speaks to us, because he is the Messiah, we need to pay attention to him. There are a lot of people who will acknowledge the existence of Jesus. They will even go as far as to say he was a good example. He was a nice guy. Uh, he was a moral guy. He was a good teacher. But they really don't pay attention to who he really was, to what he really said, or who he actually claimed to be. We have so-called pastors that say Jesus never played the God card. Jesus never claimed to be God. Evidently, they don't study their Bible because he did. But th this, is, this is the group of the Hebrews the writer is addressing tonight. Those who intellectually acknowledge Jesus, but didn't really put their faith in him. It was all in their head. They knew Jesus, but they neglected his words. They neglected his gospel. And there are millions of people like this today. They aren't against Christ, but they aren't really for him either. They might even be a member of a church but they have never really fully committed to Christ. They've never really fully given their life to him. They're neglecting him. They, he is nowhere close to being number one in their life, not even a close second. And I can tell you right now that these are the hardest people on the planet to reach. Because they think they're okay. They think that just acknowledging Jesus is enough. They think that believing in God will cut it, but it won't. And this is precisely why Hebrews was written. Because if you think about the Jews, the Jews believed in God, right? They were his chosen people. And they thought that they were doing what was right. Paul thought that he was doing what was right. 
Right? Paul thought he was right in what he was doing. But he wasn't. He was neglecting Christ. They are ne- neglecting Jesus. They're neglecting the gospel. And that's why the writer wrote this letter. Because you cannot neglect Jesus and escape the judgment. And we have a serious problem that only Christ can solve. Only Christ. No other priest, no other sacrifice, no other king can help us. And let's not lose sight of that uh, in these upcoming weeks. Government cannot save us. Only Jesus can do that. So let's look at our text tonight and see the great salvation that only Christ Jesus provides. Uh, stand with me if, you, if you're physically able. Um, we're going to read Hebrews chapter 2 and we're going to read the first nine verses. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and as was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crowned him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for In that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. You may be seated. Now, I'll I'll admit to you tonight that I've read these verses before more than a few times, and I've heard sermons preached on them, but I never really dug into them until these past few weeks. And, And while I was studying, I came to the conclusion that I had the gist of this passage correct, but there were things I missed. There were words that I really didn't quite understand, or or really some of them I completely misunderstood. I'm gonna let you know the thing that helped me. The biggest help to me was remembering the audience that Hebrews was written to. And if you remember uh, those three audiences um, and the three divisions of the people that the writer of Hebrews wrote to, this passage was written to those who knew of Jesus but had not fully trusted in him. Uh, Their belief was superficial. It was a superficial head knowledge of Christ. It was not a deeply profound, heartfelt belief in him. They believed in him, right, that he existed, but they did not believe on him. They did not place their faith into him. Um, Much like John Madden, um, I don't know if you know who John Madden is. Uh, All the boys probably play that game all the time. They probably don't know who he is. Um, But he was a coach. Uh, He was a, a commentator. He was just a really goofy, likable guy. Um, But John Madden would not get on an airplane. Would not. Now, he believed that airplanes could fly. He knew how they worked. And he knew that they could carry him from point A to point B. But he never put his faith in one. He never got into a plane. He wouldn't do it. And this is where some of the Hebrews were. And sadly, this is a condition of many people today. And maybe you're one of those people. I don't know. God does. Now, what if you're not one of these people? Um, does that mean you can just check out and, and take a nap or, or pitchfork the message over your shoulder to the person behind you? No. Nice try, though. Um, this passage can still deepen your faith. It can still deepen your understanding of Scripture, help you understand how great God is. 
and to let you see that Christ is far better than we can ever understand. He is far better than our minds can even comprehend. So look at verse 1. It says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. The first thing we can see regarding this great salvation is that we can't drift away from it. This chapter begins with a therefore, and you remember anytime you see a therefore in Scripture, you go back and to see what it's there for, right? Um, but we already know because we've been studying this for the last two weeks. So the writer is saying, because of all that I've just told you about Jesus being greater than everything, including angels, we need to pay very close attention to the things that we have heard him say or heard of him. It says, earnest heed. That's what the, the uh, King James says, earnest heed. Now, that phrase, if you look it up in, in the Greek, it literally means to more super abundantly pay attention. Okay? To give him and his word the most attention we possibly can. If you could pay attention to only one thing, this would be it. That is how important the gospel of Christ is. Now, I'm pretty sure that all of us have biffed it on this one once or twice and paid attention to something else more closely. But the writer isn't talking about the sin of misplaced attention. He's talking about apathy. He's talking about no attention, not caring at all. And really, the language here is a nautical, earnest heed, uh, really gives you a picture of a ship being moored to a dock. Okay, the ship is firmly fixed. And let slip, probably better translated drift away, carries it with it the idea of a ship that wasn't anchored or wasn't tied off and it was allowed to drift past the harbor, past the dock and into ruin. And really, those who aren't anchored to Christ and the gospel will be like a ship that was not moored to a dock. They're in danger of being shipwrecked. And that's what Paul was talking to Timothy about in 1 Timothy 1.19 when he said, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. These people have shipwrecked their faith because they didn't pay attention. Your faith has to be anchored in Christ. He is your rock. He is your stability. And once you are moored to him, the rope can never be untied. We need to understand that. But we also need to be careful and pay attention that we actually tie it to him and not something else. Think of it this way. If you had a ship and it contained everything you owned, all that you had, you would be extremely careful to make sure that you tied it securely to the dock. That's what verse 1 is talking about. Look at verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Next we see that we must not neglect this great salvation. It says, if the word spoken... A, by angels was steadfast if it was reliable. Now, the way if is used here is not like the way we use it today. Okay, it's not if, like maybe. It's more akin to since or because. So, since the word spoken by angels was proven to be reliable, then we need to do this. And we talked about this last week. Angels were very highly regarded by the Hebrews. Because they believed it, and, and the Bible says that they were involved in the process of bringing the law to Israel. And Paul writes about it in Galatians uh, chapter 3 and verse 19. He says, Wherefore then serves the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, the law came to show us our sinfulness and the angels were participants in bringing us that law. 
they brought the law to me, and they helped the law come to me, and this law was just. Why was it just? Because it came from God himself. Now, then the writer mentions uh, two different types of law-breaking. Okay, first he says transgression. Okay, transgression is to willfully, consciously, actively step across a line that has been made. So that's active. You're clearly going against something. Then he talks about disobedience. And disobedience is the idea of not listening or not paying attention. So this is inattention to God's commands or just plugging your ears so you can't hear. Even though one is active and and one is passive, they're both sinful and they both deserve retribution under the law. That's what he's saying. And the law brought justice to both the active and the passive lawbreaker. The law brought justice to the one who went out and did something, and the law brought justice to someone who did nothing when they were supposed to do something. Now, since we are all lawbreakers, right? Everybody agrees we're all lawbreakers. How will we escape judgment if we neglect so great a salvation? If disobedience to the old covenant brought swift judgment, how much worse will it be under the new covenant? Because the new covenant is mediated by someone who is far greater than the angels. The greater message and the greater messenger of the new covenant demand a greater punishment for neglecting it or disobeying it. And Jesus explained this to his disciples in Matthew 10. When they were going out, he said, And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake the dust off your feet. It shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. It's, the punishment is far worse. So how can we escape this judgment? If we neglect the gospel, how do we escape? We can't. The gospel is the only way to escape. There is no back door into heaven. There's no other way to escape judgment. It's only through Christ. It's only in Christ that we escape. Look at the last part of verse 3. Which at the first, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed and Unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Now we see that the three witnesses testify of this salvation. Alluding to the requirements of uh, the law, the writer of Hebrews shows us the three witnesses. He lays them out in succession. He says, first... The Lord himself told us of this salvation. While Christ was on earth, he preached repentance. And he explained that he was the only way to God. Second, the disciples and all those who heard Jesus preach relayed this message of salvation to the next generation. Now let's pause just for a second. This Hebrew audience that was being written to knew of Christ because those who followed him and faithfully proclaimed his message. That's how they knew. How will the next generation know about Christ and the gospel if we don't follow him faithfully and proclaim his message? How will they know? And this wasn't just pastors. This was everyone, every Christian. He says, those who heard him All of them were witnesses. Now third, we see that God was a witness to the salvation that comes through Christ alone. The miracles that Jesus did, the power that he demonstrated, was proof that he was the Messiah. It was proof that the Father was with him. John 10, 38, Jesus says, Though you believe not in me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Jesus said, look, if you you don't believe what I'm saying, at least look at what I'm doing and know that I'm the Messiah. Know that I'm the one that you have been looking for all this time. 
God approved of Christ's message, and he approved of the disciples spreading that same message. And he gave them power to do miracles. He gifted them through his Holy Spirit to enable them to spread the message. Again, we see that every person of the Trinity is involved in this great salvation that only comes through the preaching of the gospel. Now, who is this salvation for? Who is it for? Look at verse 5. He says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. It's not for the angels. We return to the topic of angels that was started in the last chapter, and the, and the writer of Hebrews is further separating the angels from the subject matter at hand. And he states that God has not put the world to come in subjection to the angels. And then he states that that's what we're talking about. And he's, he's referencing the millennial kingdom here. When Christ returns, the angels will have no part in reigning. They will be servants. They will be ministers of Christ and the saints. Remember, we talked about that last week. Their state is fixed. Salvation is not for them. Christ came to redeem us from the curse of sin, not angels. Now stick with me here. Look at verse 6. But in one... But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crowned him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. This great salvation is for mankind. Now, the writer starts with a section saying that one said in a certain place. And, and I believe this is just me, but you can, you can check it out for yourself. I believe that this is the author's way of showing that the content of the message is, is more important than the human author. We know that all scripture came from God, and that is what's important. And, and this seems really, we talked about this in the very beginning, that the, the, that's why the author of this book isn't mentioned either. And it appears the writer of Hebrews wanted the reader, us, to understand that the Holy Spirit is the author, author of the entire Bible. And that's the point being made here. The author wasn't unlearned. He's making a point. And he's referencing Psalm 8, specifically verses 4 through 6. But uh, let's look at the whole thing. It makes more sense that way. It's just a few verses, so let's read it. If you want to... Go with me to Psalm 8. <clears throat> o Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has sent thy, set thy glory in the heavens, above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength of thine enemies, or because of thine enemies, that thou may <clears throat> mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens... The work of thy fingers, the moon, and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen. Yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth. Through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. <clears throat> Who is King David talking about? Now, Jesus was called the Son of Man, but that was in reference to his humanity. Ezekiel was called the Son of Man also. Also a reference to his humanity. So who's David talking about? In Psalms and in Hebrews, it's quoting David. Both of those, man and son of man, are referring to mankind in general. And as I said, stick with me. Both of these are instances referring to mankind's original position. Okay? David talks about all the wonderful things that God had created and how vast and wonderful they are. And then he says, what is man? 
Look at man. We're, we're so tiny. We seem so insignificant. Why would God even think of us? Why would he care? That's what David is saying. But God does care. And we are the crown of creation. He made us in his image. If you look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, we, we read about where God originally placed man. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. This is very similar language to what David used in Psalms and what we just read in Hebrews. That is where we began. But that is not where we are now. Look at the, look at the last part of verse 8. He says, But now we see not yet all things put under him. Now we see mankind's overriding problem. All of creation was subject to man, to mankind. We had dominion, we were in charge, but we messed it up. And now, at this present time, things aren't subject to mankind. Sin corrupted all of creation. Everything was affected by it. We lost our position, and we inherited a nature that is prone to wander, a nature that is at war with God, a nature that is at odds with our Creator. What, what could be done to fix that? What could be done to make that right? Who could restore what Adam lost? God had a plan. And it was from the very beginning. Look at verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Finally, we see mankind's only propitiation. And this is one of the, the glorious conjunctions in the Bible. God created everything. Everything was great. Man completely messed it up, doomed humanity. But Jesus... There was Jesus. And we see Jesus, who was made as a man, a little lower than the angels. If you remember in chapter 1, the writer is laying out, laid out the deity of Christ. How we understood that Christ is God. The Messiah is God. And now he's demonstrating the humanity of Christ. Christ came as a man, not an angel. A man. Jesus came as the second Adam to redeem what the first Adam lost. He fulfilled man's original purpose. Philippians 2.8 says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Jesus was God incarnate, God in the flesh. And he came to be our substitute. 1 John 4.10 says, Here it is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He tasted death for us. He took our punishment. He took our judgment. He is the only way we can escape. There is no other way. Jesus prayed in the garden hours before he was crucified. Father, if there be any other way. But there was no other way. He had to go to the cross. He had to come fully as a man. There, 
He had to be here. There could be, that's the only way he could be our substitute. That's the only way he could be our propitiation. And he had to be fully God so he could suffer for all of mankind. So he could taste death for every man. And that is why his salvation, this salvation is so great. Now as we prepare to close and Brother Russell comes, we stand together. I pray that you, tonight, that you will truly see Jesus. See him as the one who died in your place. See him as your Savior. See him as your Lord. See him as your brother. See him as the only way. How can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We can't. And how will the world know how to escape if we don't tell them? They won't. Have you put your faith fully, completely in Christ? Is this just something you think about and like, oh yes, I, I, I believe that? Or is your faith fully in him? If you haven't, repent and do that tonight. Maybe you've been lax in telling others about Christ's great salvation. Repent. Go tell somebody. Go tell everybody. Because there is no other way to escape God's judgment.